Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. Well, welcome back to our podcast, which gratefully has made Apple's top 25 business podcasts. And that's because of you, our loyal listeners, and because of fascinating, wonderful leaders who are our guests who are doing it right. And we have one today. Today's show is highlighting Tamara Barker, who made her mark in a male-dominated industry, rising from the ranks in UPS. First, she started as a delivery driver, I can't wait to hear about that, to recently retiring as the C-Suite Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of Environmental Affairs plus Domestic Plant Engineering. Tamara is going to share with us how she's now transitioning just recently from that C-Suite into retirement, one of those things that we all are looking forward to. So a little bit more about Tamara before we get started. With her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering technology from New Mexico State University, she says it was game on from the very beginning of her 31 years at UPS. She now lives in Atlanta and she's anything but retired. So let's let Tamara tell us to start with how she says luck took her down her career path and what she's learned about navigating the roles at the top. So we are broadcasting by phone today and Tamara, welcome from Atlanta. Thank you, Valerie. We're so glad to have you. I can't wait to hear this story about what it was like when that first day came and there you were in front of this big truck. Tell us about how you even got there and what that was like. <laughs> well, I was very fortunate in that um, I had graduated from college, um, got married and, and followed my husband um, to Cincinnati, Ohio. He, was, uh, he played football in the NFL for Cincinnati and um, I went there seeking employment. Um, it so happened that I, I met a, a gentleman um, through his, his uh, wife that worked for UPS. And uh, after looking to start my career um, at GE or Procter & Gamble or the Kroger Company, um, he said, well, you know, we can give you a job at UPS. It's a great company, uh, great career opportunities, um, but you have to drive a truck first. And um, being one that was never afraid of any challenge, um, I said, sure, I'll, I'll accept that challenge. And um, I will never forget when I went for the interview, um, it's a day that's, that's forever <laughs> marked in my mind. The human resources uh, person who was doing the interviewing uh, as well as demonstration was a, a rather large um, in stature person, um, and I'm not so large in stature. And uh, she said that there was no way that I could physically do that job. Well, at that point, don't throw out a challenge to me because I knew <laughs> that not only could I do the job, but I could probably do it better than a lot of the people that were out there doing it right then and there. So that really started uh, my career at UPS. And forever grateful for that opportunity because package delivery is the core of what UPS does. So it gave me that experience uh, from the ground up that I've carried throughout my career. Um, you know, from there, I was able to use uh, my education, apply for a position to go into the engineering group. And uh, from there, I, I did several different rotations in engineering, um, and then eventually up to uh, retiring as a CSO and, and vice president of domestic plant engineering and environmental affairs. That's just a fascinating story. I don't know how many um, women today would even think about driving a truck. And on the other hand, I know better because I see a lot of them in the delivery business. What do you think the statistics are now, Tamara, on the male-female gender of 
delivery, uh, package delivery? Um, you know, I apologize. I don't have those exact statistics. I know when I began as a driver, I was in a, a, a center who had about 100 drivers and there were only two females. Um, I, I would venture to guess we're, we're probably now up 20, 25% perhaps female delivery drivers. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I asked that question because there's a big push now for women to know about all kinds of employment opportunities that maybe they might not think of previously. So as an example, you're just mentioning one, construction is another one, and so forth. So there's so much opportunity for women that likely wasn't even considered in the past, don't you think? Oh, I agree. I absolutely agree. And and, you know, I, I think so much focus was placed in the past on, on you know, a, the physical stature of someone or, or the perceived physical abilities, um, when that's, that really shouldn't be what a person's qualifications are based upon because, you know, as now we've got tools to do the jobs and we learn how to work smarter and not harder and accomplish results that we need to when it comes to those physical types of, of, of uh, jobs. Sure. So you rose in the ranks, and I'm curious to know about what the chief sustainability officer is like, and you are doing, did do that worldwide. Am I right on that? Right. So, so tell- UPS is a worldwide company. Um, sustainability um, is run out of our corporate headquarters, though we have representatives uh, in every region around the world in which we operate. But but the role of the CSO is, is really to, to guide the company to focus on those things that are most important and most relevant to our business um, when it comes to sustainability. Um, sustainability is a very broad, um, very, very broad and encompassing term, um, and different companies impact um, the sustainability goals in, in different ways. So, my, my job was to focus on those that we could have the most significant impact on uh, and ensure that it was at the core of the business that we do. So give us some examples uh, such as the renewable fuel. What are all of the aspects of what UPS does and what parts of that are helpful in, in uh, diminishing our environment uh, globally? So when, it, when we talk about uh, renewables, we will really focus for this conversation on, on vehicle uh, renewables. And UPS has what we call a rolling laboratory um, because we operate in so many different um, terrains, diverse environments, diverse elements. There's really not a one solution fits all for all of those. Um, electric vehicles, they perhaps don't perform so well um, in very, very cold environments. They're not good for very long-range deliveries or long-range routes. So we can't say we'll go all electric vehicles because at this time it's just not possible. So we test a variety of fuels in different applications. We have compressed natural gas. We have liquefied natural gas. We have propane. We have electric. We have hybrid electric. Um, pretty much every type of fuel that's out there, we have in some form or fashion currently in in a test mode. And by using this live rolling laboratory, we're able to best determine the most efficient vehicle and the most efficient fuel for the conditions in which that vehicle operates. Anna, did you have a comment about that? Yes, I did. Um, it sounds, that's a personal interest that I have. How? Oops, let me take that lower. Um, so how um, UPS is uh, reducing their carbon footprint, which is so important and it has been on the news uh, so often. So would you like to talk a little, develop a little more on that? Because on leadership, that has been a big topic. So how is UPS reducing our carbon footprint? Um, several ways. One is is this rolling laboratory that, that we we continue to uh, work with manufacturers um, on, on perfecting the fuel consumption of the vehicles and perfecting the operation of the vehicles. We also are, are we're firm believers that the greenest mile is the mile that's never driven. Um, therefore, we optimize the routes of our drivers. We fully deployed Orion, um, which at the, every, the beginning of every day fully optimizes that driver's routes based on the packages that they have on their vehicle for delivery. Um, we are currently rolling out Orion 
um, which is basically a, it's it's a live um, live update as the driver goes through the day. So if if for example there is a, a, a package that is found on the driver's route or if there are traffic conditions that would hold that driver up and he or she would have to sit idling, Orion will reroute and find the most optimal route for that driver so that we're not driving unnecessary miles or sitting idling, wasting fuel, and not making deliveries. Uh, we're also, um, you know, in listening to our customers, um, listening to society, not every package has to be delivered to a front door uh, with with. Society, the way that, that we're, we're moving today in, in, you know, apartment buildings or condominiums where we may not be able to leave packages at every door, the preferred is to either have them delivered to their workplace or to access points so that the customer at their convenience can pick those packages up. It's fascinating, it is, isn't it? You know, I just, uh, I'm at my office or at my home and I see my UPS person come. And by the way, the person who delivers my packages has been there forever. I don't know what his tenureship <laughs> is, but thinking about that, what I know about UPS is you have a lot of long-term employees, which says a lot about the company. So what would you share about what keeps people at UPS? I think what keeps people at UPS is the people. Um, uh, our customers, I know the routes that I drove when I was a driver, you develop close relationships with those customers. Um, they they kind of become part of your family because you know them. A, a lot of residential customers, especially with the continued evolution of e-commerce, you're making deliveries to those customers daily. Um, so they really become like family. Um, and the, the company is, the, the ethics can't be topped at UPS. Um, the compensation is excellent. Our benefits are excellent, uh, and it's it's just it's truly a company that's owned by our employees, mm -hmm. and um, you know a great deal of job security uh, at at UPS. We we always um, are very frugal, very conscious of of how we spend, how we expand, and I think our employees um, appreciate that and, and feel a sense of security at UPS. That's nice to hear. That's what the show is all about, doing it right, whether it's the company or the individual, and in this case, it's both. Tamara, I'd like to ask you about what it was like as a leader, the challenges and maybe the benefits of being a woman as you climbed that ladder to the C-suite in this very male-dominated industry. Well, certainly it was a challenge. You know, not only is, is transportation male-dominated, um, but then you take even a further dominated uh, discipline in that being engineering. So it, it's almost like I, you know, I had a <laughs> double stack against me. Um, because we, there were you know, females in management when I, I was first hired at UPS, but they were in what I would call the more traditional roles, where the business development slash sales or human resources, where... You know, you saw more females um, than in engineering. So it, it was really, I, I didn't see many females at all um, at, at UPS when I went into management. And then slowly but surely, we began um, promoting and, and, and specifically recruiting females. So, so with that said, I think um, perhaps I was in the right place at the right time when the engineering function realized that there were very talented female engineers out there. And for the diversity of, of thought and for the diversity of the workforce, that engineering really had to begin early on um, down the path of diversity. So I think being a female um, and, and being one that had the opportunity to be a driver and showed that I had the grit, the determination to do that, um, it, that worked to my advantage at, at that time. So I, I really think that, that um, you know, it, it helped being a, a female in engineering um, back in the 80s. Tamara, did you ever feel there was a bias? And if so, how did you handle it? Oh, there was always a bias. Um, always. And, and, you know, I, I, the different biases not only... Um, you know the, the the gender bias, but I've I've also 
uh, and even recently, biases um, with regards to my stature, um, biases with regards to, you know, just different things that, that you, you like to think that we're beyond that as a society, but we're not. Um, I, I never let those get in the way of my determination. Mm. Um, I, I think I, I have a strong sense of, of self and a lot of confidence. I never took any of the insults or comments personally. Um, and, and just, you know, I forged forward. If, if, I, if I felt I was right, I knew I was right, and I followed my gut, and, and I stuck to my gun. Well said, well said. I, I'm going down this path a bit with you, uh, sort of leading into women's leadership, because <laughs> that's who you are. Uh, but also, because of that, one of the books that I wrote is called Monday Morning Leadership for Women. And you know about that, because your company is using this gratefully in your um, women's development, leadership development initiative. And so I hear a lot, and I do a lot of executive coaching with women leaders. And the other thing that they talk about, and I'd like you to address, is probably in 31 years, Tamara, you might have had somewhere along the line a boss that maybe wasn't your preference, shall we say? We all have those times when difficult people. So how would you suggest a woman handle working for someone who maybe has biases but for whatever reason it's a difficult relationship how would a leader a woman leader handle that kind of a situation well i think i think several ways i think number one you know knowing who you are and that can kind of be an, an ambiguous term i i know but knowing knowing what who you are, knowing what your ethics, your morals, your beliefs are, and, and, and no matter what, holding on to that, number one. Um, and number two, and I, I didn't learn this until later in my career, is to, to find someone that can be a mentor to you, mm. uh, whether it be another, you know, a, a female, whether it can be a male, um, same function, another function, find someone um, who can who can be a mentor and who, who can you can talk confidentially to about the struggles and and you know I, I have had some tough bosses um, I, I, I shouldn't say tough because I think it's you can work for a tough person you know what their expectations are but when you work for a person who is just unreasonable or unethical um, those those are the the tougher ones to deal with but again I think holding true to your values um, they don't, bosses don't last forever. They don't last forever. Um, so just, just do what you have to, to, to again, just stand your ground and, and make sure that you're confident in your decisions um, and, and uh, know that you can get through it. I know I'm greatly simplifying it, but, but I just think back to those challenges that I had and, and what I had to do to get through those tough times. Well, that's good advice, Tamara. And when you're feeling the uh, loyalty and commitment to the company and to your role and you're enjoying what you do to your point people will come and go the door is a revolving one so stand your ground i like what you said too about know you know who you are and what does that look like well in branding terms it looks like really deeply going within yourself and not only knowing what your strengths are a lot of the strengths finder uh, information is out there and it's one thing to be told your strengths but it's another thing to really deeply own those things about you that you know are strong and value propositions that you bring to the table and those things that also may be a little bit different than somebody that has the same position sitting next to you everybody's different just like every thumbprint is different we all bring different things so I'd like you to talk about that just for a moment. Is is owning the the essence of you as a leader. How do you lead with that? In other words, if women are listening to this podcast and they are bosses, what kind of attributes typically are being used to the best in leading people today? Um, I, I think those attributes number one is, is confidence. 
again, if, if you have confidence in yourself and you have confidence in your decision making, uh, your, your people know that and they appreciate that um, and they'll follow you. I think uh, you have to have honesty and integrity in all that you do mm -hmm. um, and never waver from that. Um, even when uh, the business may call for you to do something else, you, you just can't. You, you have to know that as long as you're honest in all of your intentions, that your people will follow you and your people will do what you ask them and need them to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to have uh, a sense of accountability with your people. Um, and, and, you know, accountability doesn't, isn't always a negative thing. People want to be held accountable. Um, they, the, everybody wants to know what their boundaries are, and human nature will push you to the edge of those boundaries. And I think it's important that you hold people accountable and understand that you hold different people accountable in different ways. But as long as people are seeing themselves and others held accountable, they'll have a greater deal of respect for you. And again, they'll respond and do what you need them to do. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've always been one that, that's been somewhat transparent with people. And, I, you know, that you, not total transparency. There has to be some limitations on that. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to be transparent with your people. And, and you know, some of those things that we talked about in, in one of the leadership development um, uh, conference calls with UPS is that um, there's, sh there were, there's always been such a shroud of secrecy around people and people's lives. Well, People's lives, they, they really do matter, and people's lives get brought into the workplace. And I'm human, too, and I'm transparent about things that happen in my family that may affect my my day-to-day mm -hmm. -day activities or mm -hmm. may affect my thinking or may affect my decision-making, but it's only a temporary thing. But if I'm transparent with my people, they, they understand me, they trust me, they know that I'm being honest, that I have integrity. Then again, that just leads to a greater sense of, of trust and teamwork with those people. That word trust, there you go again. It's the one thing, this is statistics, the one thing that any team lacks above all is usually trust. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sad? But transparency is, is very much part of the answer on that. I agree with you. Do you think, Tamara, that, uh, here's a loaded question, do you think that men or women are better leaders? <laughs> you know, I, I think they're different leaders. I, I really think that they're different. Um, I, I can't say that one is better or the other because I would, I would be showing some bias there. I, but I think that men and women lead differently. Um, you know, I, I heard it said at one point in my career that, that women tend to lead from behind. Um, and, and, you know, as I watched myself grow, I think that that's true because to me, leading from behind doesn't mean that I go in and correct things that are wrong that my people did. It's that I give them a direction. I, I tell them what that North Star is, and I point them that way, and through a series of checks and balances and coaching and counseling, I ensure that they're staying on that path, and when they make it off the path, then that's when we bring them back on. So I'm not telling them exactly how to get there, but I'm making sure that they're staying on that path. Whereas I think men tend to want to say, you do it this way. Hmm. So a little bit maybe more collaborative rather than tell, tell, tell. And every yeah, individual I, is different. I, Tamara, I've always said to male or female clients, you know what, we are professionals in the workplace. Forget about, well, I'm a man or I'm a woman. We're all professionals. And if we just uh, approached work with that mentality, I think that would be helpful. What do you think? Oh, I agree. I, I agree. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and having that mentality will just continue to further break down um, any biases that, that exist, you know, that we're all professionals. It doesn't matter, you know, what your physical appearances are. Um, we're all professionals. And 
yesterday I just happened to um, be speaking with the young man who's running this initiative for um, the women's series on Monday Morning Leadership for Women, and mm -hmm. you happen to have been his boss uh, up yes. the ladder. And he gave me a comment, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but here's the question I asked him. I said, what's one word that you would use to describe Tamara as a leader, as a boss? So now I'm going to ask you, if you could select <laughs> one word, Tamara, that sort of encapsulated, encapsulates who you are, what might that word be? Oh, wow. Um... Goodness, I have a bunch of them going through my mind. I'll give you more than one. Go ahead. <laughs> I, well, it has to be just one word or kind of No, I'll you? give you two. I, How's that? <laughs> I, I think fearless, number one. Um, uh, always believing in my people. Mm. Um, always, always standing up. For them, um, you know, but uh, but understanding on the back side of that, if if there was something that they did wrong, that's a, a conversation, you know, one on one with them, but certainly not a public one. But gosh, that's hard, Valerie. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I, I think I perhaps endearing maybe might be fearless, you know, but yet endearing to my people. I like fearless. What does that look like? Um, I think fearless is, is, again, having the confidence in the decisions that I make. Um, not everyone agrees with that, but that's not my job is to make, you know, make sure everyone agrees with my decision. That's, that's my decision, and I'm confident in that. Mm -hmm. um, I was honest out of intent and purpose when I made that decision. So I, I think with that, I'm, I'm not afraid if... if um, you know, there's not agreement with the decision. It's the decision that I made. So I, I, I was always fearless. I, I, I was not necessarily conforming, um, which that's not necessarily to mean that that was negative. You know, I was negative or I was rebellious or disrespectful. Um, but I think my decisions differed from others, and I was fearless in standing behind my decisions. You know, Tamara, so you've said a lot of things about self-confidence and fearless and, and some of the other words. Did you ever have doubts about yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I asked that question for a reason, and I'm glad you gave that answer, because research recently, and I'm sorry I don't have the, um, the actual statistic on where it came from, but it's a truth it was done for women leaders at the top and there were many questions but the one that relates to what we're talking about was this when you got to the c-suite did you ever have doubts and to the woman of I don't know how many hundreds they interviewed Tamara every single one of them said exactly what you did so elaborate a little bit on that. Doubts, hmm, because, you know, we think, well, Lands, you've made it to the top, so you must not ever think that you're not making the right decisions. What does doubt look like? Well, I think doubt, doubt it looks like when you're driving home at the end of your day, um, reflecting back on your day and, you know, should I have done this differently? You know, was that really the right decision? What are the repercussions going to be? Um, you know, do I, do I have a chance to go do it again? But, you know, none of that is, is portrayed in, in front of your people, but to you in, internally, then you, you go back through all of those. But I think that's part of, of growing and maturing, too, is, is reflecting back and thinking, what could I have done differently? What mm -hmm. should I do differently next time, you know? And I think if you if you don't doubt yourself and you don't question yourself at the end of every day, you probably stop growing as a leader. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Well, Tamara, in in uh, the final question, I'd love for you to leave listeners, women who are um, aspiring leaders or in a position of of authority, have direct reports, 
And those who are considering, do I even want to have direct reports or am I fine being an individual contributor? Basically, my question is, could you give us just three tips to, um, to being a, a woman in leadership today? Three things you think are most important. Um, I, I think know, know your responsibilities, know your job better than anyone else knows it. And then in that, be confident that you know it and confident in your decision making. Um, again, it comes back to the, the honesty and integrity and um, your ethics. You know, know what you stand for and don't waver. Don't waver on that. Um, and then I think uh, I think it goes to, to the uh, accountability of your of your people. Um, I, and I think I've already said these things, but I think um, accountability of your people because everybody on your team wants to know what their limits are. Mm-hmm. And, and they want to know that the whole team is, is being held accountable in some form or fashion. Those are three good tips. And finally, now that you're retired, I said at the beginning <laughs> of the show, I wanted those people who may be considering it in the near future or somewhere out there, what are you enjoying the most? <laughs> um... I am enjoying the most being my own boss. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it really is uh, planning my week out and then executing that plan, getting things done, you know, that personally that I wanted to, to get done. Um, and, and knowing that if I just want to pick up and go visit the grandchildren or I want to pick up and, and go somewhere or... I was up in uh, Cincinnati a couple of weeks ago with my daughter and grandsons, and she needed me to stay an extra day because uh, the babysitter um, had an issue. And the flexibility to do that, that's, I mean, that's just invaluable to be able to not have to worry about, you know, meetings or Monday work or anything like that. Um, and then more outdoors. Um, you know, I, I love the outdoors. Uh, being able to to get out with uh, the kayak or go hiking or on the bike or it's just it's great just being able to be outdoors the majority of the days. Well, you know what? You certainly deserve to do all of that and more. Tamara, thank you so much for being on the show today and just continue to enjoy life <laughs> at its fullest. <laughs> Thank and you so much. You're welcome. And for our listeners, thank you for tuning in. I hope you got some good nuggets of leadership truth today. Be sure to make comments. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I'd appreciate it if you do and share it with others. In the meantime, stay authentic, live your brand. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.